this is a video series uh, designed to talk about the mortgage crisis in a nutshell. And it came from the idea that uh, I have been working with a number of people, including Eric Veith, who's making this video with me, to try to get my head around what's gone wrong in the American uh, mortgage industry, how it's all related between bad loans and the bailouts and foreclosures and all the things I'm seeing in the news and robo-signing and empty homes on my street. Uh, and what I've tried to do here is in some pretty simple terms, admittedly not in immense detail, not always from a scholarly perspective, but from a hands-on perspective, talk about how this all started, what's gone on in the past, and what's going on now in the mortgage crisis in America. You probably heard about robo-signers. You might have heard about the bailout. <laughs> Bet you have. You've heard of TARP. You probably heard something about Goldman Sachs. Uh, you've heard about foreclosures, and you know that homes in your neighborhood, their values are going down. You probably know somebody who's lost their home or is worried about losing their home, or uh, you might have lost or are worrying about losing your own home. What I want to do in this video is help you understand how things like exotic mortgages, uh, the bailout, foreclosures, and foreclosure crisis, uh, how those things fit together, how they're affecting people around you, how they affect you, and the reason I want to do that is because I think if you understand it, you might be able to help fix it. And I'm convinced that until people understand it, the only people who will continue to profit from it are the people who invented it. And that's generally the banks and Wall Street. And they profited so far uh, to the, at the expense of you and American homeowners. And so I'm going to tell you about it. I have worked with pieces of what I'm going to call the mortgage crisis for years, ranging from uh, working with people who were given loans that they thought they could afford, that they later found out they couldn't, uh, to working with people who are being foreclosed on in their homes and who are wondering who it is that's foreclosing, why they're foreclosing, and what they can do if they think the foreclosure is wrong, all the way to people who are being kicked out of their homes uh, after a foreclosure, even though they still want to defend their home, they still believe uh, that they were paying on time and they can't get anybody to listen. And there's a lot of things in between. I've read about this, I've studied this, and what I realized was when I hear the media report about robo-signers uh, or I hear the media report about uh, adjustable rate mortgages or a uh, horrible foreclosure in Florida where a bank foreclosed on a home that didn't even have a loan, those are pieces of a bigger picture. And if we can see the big picture a little bit and start to get our head around it, I think there are some simple ideas and probably a lot of things I haven't thought of that others will that could make a difference uh, but we can't talk about those things if we don't know what happened and what's happening right now. Uh, I'd say this, you don't need to trust me. I'm going to talk about it in a way that is at least I'm comfortable with and I think can be proven and is true. But I'd invite you to go out and start reading about this after you watch this video. Put me to, to the test. Check out the stuff we're talking about. I think you're going to be shocked uh, with what you find out about what has happened in America to the American dream of owning a home and the role that large financial institutions and banks have played in destroying our economy, uh, in devastating the ability for people to own homes and damaging your property values, and how they continue today to profit from it at the expense of the taxpayers, of the people in the homes, uh, and I think they do it because of the system that is so complex that nobody's really gotten their head around it, at least not the average person. In my mind, the problem began in a pretty simple, simple way. And we'll have somebody that I'll call Joe, Joe the home buyer, who just wanted to buy his first or second house. Uh, maybe he'd owned a home before, maybe he wanted to buy a bigger house. Maybe Joe had never owned a home. Sometimes Joe was Susan, a single mother. Sometimes it was Joe and Susan. But we had somebody who wanted to buy a house. And they went to borrow money. And very often, in the early 2000s, the person they went to or the entity they went to was a non-traditional lender. That's what I have here, a non-traditional lender. Give you an example because you've probably heard of them. Uh, their initials are AMQ. Uh, they're called AmeriQuest. Okay, that's AmeriQuest. And when I write it, you may have flashes AmeriQuest of the Super Bowl because the mid-2000s, AmeriQuest sponsored the Super Bowl halftime show. This was a big company with billions of dollars. And they were a non-traditional lender. Here's what AmeriQuest did. They gave loans to people like Joe, and usually they gave loans to people who, this term you probably heard a lot, 
were subprime. A couple things about subprime. Subprime usually meant uh, somebody who didn't have a perfect credit score. Uh, but we know that a lot of people who got subprime loans just didn't understand their credit scores. Uh, there's different numbers out there, but certainly a good hunk of people who got subprime loans had decent credit, probably could have gotten a loan at a community bank, but they were marketed heavily to by people like AmeriQuest and others. Okay, so they go in, they want a loan, and let's just talk through it because you probably heard that people like Joe get what they deserve. You've heard at least some people say this because why would anybody take a loan they can't pay? Well, I want to tell you at least what I've experienced talking to people like Joe. Joe took a loan from AmeriQuest, and when he went in, he said, I'd like to borrow enough money to buy a home. Maybe he had a house in mind. Maybe he had a price point in mind. Or maybe he said, I can afford $800 or $1,000 a month, and that's all I can afford. AmeriQuest would often say to Joe, Joe, good news. You can buy a bigger house, bigger than you've been planning, twice as big. And Joe says, well, how is that possible? And they say, look. Loans don't work like they used to. Uh, we got really good rates and really good deals and we can put you in a home. And so what would often happen, and we'll just use really simple numbers, is that a $100,000 loan became a $200,000 loan for Joe. And who didn't want a little more house for their family, an extra bathroom for the kids, another spot in the garage? How did they do it and why? Well, this is it in a nutshell. AmeriQuest had the ability to make loans to people like Joe with very little underwriting, all right? And we'll talk later, but traditional banks would carefully vet or examine borrowers. AmeriQuest started doing what were called no-doc or sometimes called liar's loans. Uh, and what they were were, they would make a loan where the income was never verified. And in fact, often the person making the loan would actually pretend Joe had more income than he did. Now, it wasn't Joe who wrote that into the documents. It was often the employees of these companies. Why would they do that? Well, the employees were paid on commission. And if you can, you can imagine, if you got a percentage of 100,000 or a percentage of 200,000, it was better to get a percentage of 200,000. They were not responsible for whether or not the loan got paid off. They made their money when the loan was written. So, they also didn't engage in any real appraisals. So when they loaned money on this $200,000 house, they didn't go out, usually, and have an appraiser walk into the home and kick the tires, so to speak, on the house. Uh, they often did an appraisal. They were in California. They'd do an appraisal from California on a house in Detroit. And they'd say, well, we'll look at houses around it and we'll take some pictures online and uh, we'll make our best guess. There was every reason to get the appraisal high enough to write the loan, especially for that person working on commission. Why would AmeriQuest let its employees do this? Well, that's where it gets interesting. AmeriQuest knew that as soon as it made the loans, within months or years, but not very long, it was going to take those loans and try to sell them. Now, why would it, a bank or an institutional or a non-institutional, non-conventional lender, why wouldn't they keep it and collect the money? That's what banks had done for years, collect the money for 30 years. AmeriQuest didn't want to collect the money. They wanted to make the money right then, as fast as they could. This is a get-rich-quick scheme. So. They'd make the loans and then they'd try to sell them. Now let's talk a little more before we move on about what kind of loans they made because it's going to be important for understanding Joe and why he loses his house later. They made what were called by many people now exotic loans. Okay, and you've heard about these. These are things like adjustable rates, all right, but they don't mean their rates could go up or down. It means the interest rate could only go up. And in fact, in most cases, in about two years, it was guaranteed to go up. They made interest only loans, which means you paid for a number of years and when you were done, you'd only paid the interest, what you owed had stayed the same. They even made loans where you paid and after a few years of paying, what you owed had gone up. Now, this was buried in often loan documents that were 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 pages. Uh, sometimes they would give you multiple copies so that what was handed to you was several hundred pages of loan documents. And where did these closings happen? Well. Uh, they'd, they'd meet you on your lunch hour. Uh, they'd send a notary out to a restaurant. They'd run by your house after work. All right? And so for the average person taking a loan, examining 400 pages of documents or 50 pages of fine print was intimidating. And if they told them what the loan was and they told them what the monthly payment was, they signed. The problem was those monthly payments weren't guaranteed. They could adjust and then sometimes they could double. So imagine if you took a loan because you knew you could pay $800 a month but two years from now, it's 1,200. And 18, it, it, you know, six months after that, so two and a half years, it's gone up another $200 and another 200 until your loan has doubled. 
and you can't afford it anymore. That's how people started to default on loans. But again, AmeriQuest didn't care. And we're gonna talk about that. It's because they'd sell the loans. Here's what they did. They took the loans and they put them in. This is my awful drawing of a bundle of loans. And these bundles would have sometimes a thousand loans, sometimes as many as 10,000 loans. They were loans from all over the country to all kinds of people. And they would describe them. And they'd say, this is a bundle of loans where the average interest rates from here to here, and the average credit score for the borrower is X, without talking about why that was the credit score, or how many were low and how many were high, or how many were in the middle. Uh, they'd say, generally these are adjustable rates, or whatever they'd say. And then these loans would get rated, and that's places like Moody's and things you've heard of that rate uh, different things, including stocks and securities and bonds. And they'd rate these bundles of loans. Well, these loans were usually rated AAA, which means they were really good. Why? Well, there's lots of theories, but I'll say this. If you just looked in the past at how often people didn't pay their mortgages, there was some number that was like maybe 5% of loans failed. And if you looked at these loans and said, well, these are average people taking average loans, you figured some will fail, but overall it'll perform. This bundle of loans will pay. Problem, of course, was these weren't traditional loans. As we talked about, they were exotic loans. They had no real appraisals. They hadn't been underwritten. And they were sold by people who had no skin in the game. Because once they sold the loans, they didn't care if they performed or not. So they're rated. So then people in Wall Street, let's call it a bank or an institutional investor or whoever, would buy these. Often what they would do then, this is kind of interesting, this was called securitization. All right? This is where loans became securities, things that could be bought and sold as a bundle on Wall Street. All right? And this is where investors and speculators and hedge funds started buying bundles of loans. These are sometimes called asset-backed securities. Why? Because they're securities, things you can trade, backed by a home. Asset being the home, backed securities, okay? So, here's how it would often work. You'd have somebody who gathered them up called a depositor. And that depositor would then sell them into a trust that would have a trustee. And that trustee would oversee a big bundle of loans, a what's often called a pool of loans, all right? And they had these things called pooling and servicing agreements, which were really 400 page documents in fine print that said, here's what loans are coming into this group, here's who owns them, here's who gets the money when it's paid, here's who's responsible for collecting the money. Now it's kind of interesting because the trustee had lots of helpers. They had a servicer who was supposed to collect money. Sometimes they'd have a custodian who actually held these real, these were real documents in theory, sitting somewhere and they would actually hold them. And then they'd have to try and come and collect. Now, as you probably guessed by now, in the hustle to make money as fast as you could and in the demand for more and more loans, AmeriQuest was more and more irresponsible and lenders like it, made as many loans as they could as fast as they could. And these banks weren't really paying much attention to what was in the loans. And the rating agencies were looking at summaries. They weren't pulling open the loans and looking at Joe to figure out if he really made what the loan document said, to figure out if the house was really worth 200 or 100, and to figure out what the loan would look like in two years. They weren't doing that. So everybody's buying into this idea of buying more and more loans. And as long as people pay like they've always paid, we're all gonna make lots of money. Well, there were a few problems. First of all, they didn't keep up with the documents. All right, this was moving so fast that in many cases, there's stories out there in the press of notes, documents, the original documents that meant people should pay being shredded, lost, thrown away, failed to be transferred. The second problem is a bigger one, and that is, is that too many people like Joe, who took out the loan believing they could pay it, found out two years later that the notes adjusted. And since Joe didn't magically come into 50% more income, or 200% more income, he couldn't pay. So when he couldn't pay, the notes started to fail. And to paraphrase what the banks said and these trustees and investors, they said, oh shit. Because what they'd done was, they'd bought a bill of goods that was never gonna perform. So this is where you started to hear, too big to fail. Because some companies had insured these, some companies had bought them, some companies had sold them. And Wall Street was tangled up 
in literally hundreds of billions of dollars of mortgage notes. And when they wouldn't perform the way they thought, they said, if the government doesn't help us, we're going to fail. We're going to fall apart. And when we do, the whole economy is going to fall apart. And banks are going to close. And your money is going to disappear. And investment portfolios are going to go away. And people that own mutual funds are going to lose their money. And it's going to be Armageddon. And that's what they said over and over and over again. And so enter the feds. And so the United States government, you, <laughs> paid for a bailout. And that bailout cost hundreds of billions of dollars or by some people's estimates of all the other loans and things that we won't go into that happened, trillions of dollars. It cost a lot of money. Nobody doubts that. So the banks are bailed out. And that keeps the banks propped up in theory. And so then the banks go on, in many ways, business as usual. So let's just pause and review. Okay? We've got bad loans and for a number of reasons being made by people who don't really care if they work because they're going to make their money by selling it. We've got people buying it who are being told by at least some people, these look good. But the people who are telling them they look good aren't really looking under the hood. All right? uh, they're buying the representations of this original company. Now we have these big, big banks on Wall Street and institutional investors buying and trading loans, often sloppily, often outside of compliance with their own agreements, often losing the documents, and never knowing what's in them. And then, when these loans start to fail, because people can't, the average person where it all started, can't pay on a loan that isn't what they thought it was. And they're at risk of losing their home. We have the banks say, help, 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 to the federal government, and we see them get a lot of money. Right, so that's, that takes us up to sort of the, the, the bailout. So what happens next? All right, so we were talking, and we, we sort of made it to the bailout, to banks uh, having made a pretty big bet. And of course, if you want to read a great book, read The Big Short. There's many others uh, about you know, this, I'm only giving you the tip of the iceberg. These banks bet on these notes, uh, and, and then there were bets on the bets, and bets on the bets on the bets. That's what you might have heard when you hear about CDOs and all sorts of things. So this became a huge mess, I mean, trillions of dollars of mess. And in fact, some of this stuff was even sold to other countries as a good deal. And those countries and investors overseas who bought it are also now suffering from buying it. And of course, there were companies like AIG that insured some of these. And if you insure stuff like this, you're not going to last long. And then there are companies like Goldman Sachs, who you might have seen on the news because they were doing something really interesting, and they weren't the only one. Uh, they were buying the stuff and sometimes holding these, what were going to turn out to be very bad investments. They were also selling it to others at the same time. And in fact, they were even letting people bet on it failing all at the same time. Uh, and so they've been asked by Congress uh, in some interesting questioning, how is it that you were writing memos internally that said this is bad, it's going to fail, get rid of it, but at the same time sending memos to people that buy things from you saying best chance ever to buy. Um, that might be what you've heard of when you hear people talk about Goldman Sachs. But let's move forward. Let's talk about foreclosure. So now, foreclosure can happen a couple of ways. One is somebody really doesn't pay, okay? Uh, and that happens. You know, Joe can't pay the loan. But unfortunately, we're also seeing foreclosure happen a lot of other ways. For example, someone misses one payment. They call in and they say, I, I missed the payment, what do I need to do? The bank says, we're gonna put you in a modification uh, and we're gonna change the terms of your loan so that you can better pay it. Maybe that just means we're gonna forgive some late fees. Maybe it means we're gonna get you a better interest rate because they're falling. Uh, maybe it means we're going to stretch the loan over a longer period of time. And this is where you hear about things like HAMP, right, which was a government program designed to encourage these banks to modify loans rather than foreclosing. Right? And so one big problem that, that people are seeing, we've seen, is while a person's talking to the bank about getting the loan modified because they need a different payment schedule, because they missed one payment, because they lost their job in a bad economy, I and mean, we're at 10% unemployment or 85 or 15 depending on how you want to measure it, uh, people call in and ask for a little help. And the bank says, yeah, we'll talk to you. And while they're talking to them, at the same time, often another department within the bank is moving forward to foreclose. So we see people who get foreclosed because they didn't pay. We also see a lot of people who are getting foreclosed because they're trying very hard to pay. And while they're trying to figure that out, the bank is foreclosing. All right? And that's what you might have heard called a dual track. Uh, and in the newest settlement with the big banks, which you know we could talk about whether or not it's going to help, but one of the things that some of these big institutional investors said and banks said is, we're not going to talk to people with one hand and say we're helping. 
while on the other hand we're foreclosing. All right, but no matter how it happens, we start to see foreclosures. Um, by the way, there's also some interesting stories out there. You may have heard the one from Florida where Bank of America foreclosed on a home uh, for which there was no note. All right, so in this mess of paperwork, uh, what we had was we had a situation where documents weren't kept. Sometimes I think banks don't know what they own. They don't know who's paid. They don't know who should pay. Um, and they don't know who they should foreclose on. Uh, that doesn't stop them. Okay, so how does foreclosure work? Well, uh, in, in its simplest form, the trustee tells somebody, usually it doesn't do it itself, it tells somebody else, maybe the servicer, go foreclose on Joe. And depending on what state you're in, whether you're in a judicial state, judicial, or a non-judicial state, that'll determine what needs to be done to foreclose. In a judicial state, they go to court, okay? In a non-judicial state, they don't go to court at all. So in a judicial state, in theory, they should have to file documents that show they own the note, that they're the person who should have been paid, that they haven't been paid, and that they have a right to foreclose because everything's in order and all the paperwork is right. States have always been very serious that before you kick somebody out of their home, you need to show that you're the person they owe the money to, that you hold the deed or the mortgage, and that you have the right to take the home. All right, Not just that they owe you money, but that you also have the right to the house. All right. This is a term you probably heard, robo-signers. Well, what are robo-signers? I mean, you know, if you're like me, the first time you heard it, you thought, is this like literally a robot? Is it a machine printing signatures? What this was is the banks needed people to sign documents, various documents, documents that assign the note from one person to another, documents that appoint someone as the right to foreclose, documents that attest to the chain of custody, documents that say these are true and accurate records of the payments. The problem was they didn't have these people hired and they didn't always have the documents we're learning. And so robo-signing took a couple of forms. One is people were hired who needed a job uh, and often they had a background as a waitress or a hairdresser or a truck driver or whatever. They'd never worked in finance and they were told sit at this desk, sign these affidavits that say these are true and accurate copies and that you've reviewed files, sign here and we'll stamp it with a notary. Well, the people who signed probably didn't know what they were signing. Sometimes the notary wasn't even in the same state. And sometimes they signed a name that wasn't their own. <laughs> so there were a lot of problems with robo-signing. Okay? And then these documents would be filed in court. This came out in Florida and other states where courts started to figure out what's being filed here is not really true stuff. And some good attorneys went out and took depositions where they checked on the people signing. And the people admitted, I sign hundreds of these a day. I don't know what they say and I have no qualifications to sign. Okay? We've also learned that sometimes when a document was missing, when they, they just couldn't find something, that there were companies that could even make those documents or produce them. And so there were falsified documents upon falsified signatures, upon falsified notarization. Uh, lots of problems here. That's what led, you might remember if you watch the news, uh, to at some point a few banks saying, we're not going to do any foreclosures anywhere in the country for the next 30 days. Uh, and that's because they had so many problems with the documents. Trust me, they didn't fix it in 30 days. Okay, so what about in a non-judicial state? If, if you don't live in one of these, you might find this surprising. Even if you do, you might find it surprising. Many, many states, probably, I don't know, 25 or more, uh, have allow foreclosure to occur without ever going to court. In these states, the party that thinks it's owed the home because it's not being paid, hires a trustee or goes to the trustee who's usually named in what's called a deed of trust, and they go to this trustee, okay, uh, not to be confused with the investment stuff, a trustee was a person who was supposed to be a neutral party who would figure out what was owed, publish notice that the party wasn't paying like Joe, and then have a sale of the home if Joe did not reinstate or pay. And they'd sell the home to a buyer, and then that way the home moved through foreclosure onto somebody else. Well, you would think these trustees then uh, would probably be pretty important to saying, wait a second, what about when Joe says he paid, uh, but, but the bank says he didn't, and there's a conflict? Or what about when Joe says, I don't even understand who this person is, is that's, that's foreclosing because I took a loan from AmeriQuest and you're using some big long name I've never heard of, okay? And just to give you an example, the way this works, since you have a, a servicer working for a trustee who's working for a trust, and because all these banks have turned over, one name you might see on a document might read something like, 
Wells Fargo, formerly known as, say, Wachovia, as the attorneys in fact for U.S. Bank N.A., as the trustee for certificate services, uh, certificate number 2004 WW-whatever. Okay, so literally the party that's foreclosing is a sentence long and it's pretty difficult to figure out who they are. And there's certainly, in Joe's case and in most cases, nobody Joe ever dealt with. So, trustee would probably have a lot of questions as a neutral party uh, working through a foreclosure, but the banks figured that one out too. So here's what they did. They kept the right in the deed of trust to appoint a successor trustee. So Joe and AmeriQuest agreed to a trustee. It was in the documents. His name was Bill Smith. Bill Smith does not serve as the trustee in the foreclosure. Hardly ever, probably never. Instead, the bank appoints someone who serves as a trustee. Now, who do they appoint? You could probably guess. They actually appoint, this is true, their own lawyer who has already represented them and who probably served as the debt collection firm that was writing Joe's letter saying, pay us or else. And they had that nice disclosure that some of you have been unfortunate enough to see that says, this is an attempt to collect a debt. Anything you say could be used to collect the debt. They're a debt collecting law firm. And then they're appointed what's called the, in many states, the successor, hope we spell it right on the video, trustee. They're appointed as a successor trustee. And their job is now to tell Joe that if he doesn't pay a certain amount of money to reinstate, uh, that they will take his home. That's what they do. Okay, they would appoint their own lawyer to be a successor trustee. Now, as I've mentioned, the first interesting thing is, who is this that's appointing the successor trustee? Well, maybe they got this big long name, uh, Joe never dealt with them. And you know, as a side note, a lot of the deeds of trust would say the lender could appoint a successor trustee. Well, you remember, the lender was a company like AmeriQuest. This new owner, alleged owner, is not a lender. They never lent Joe any money at all. They never loaned him money. But they appoint the successor trustee anyway. So there's all sorts of problems. And we could get really interesting here because sometimes their lawyer, acting as the lawyer for them, will appoint themselves. <laughs> so sometimes it's a neat trick where their own lawyer signs something for them to appoint their lawyer as the trustee. But at any rate, this is what you get. You get a trustee that is handpicked by the bank. And so that trustee doesn't usually ask any questions. In fact, uh, they typically, if Joe calls them, will just say, call the bank. Uh, and they're generally not gonna talk to Joe much about what's going on. They've got a great deal because they're gonna make money as the attorney for the bank. And in most states, they're gonna make money as the trustee for Joe. And get this, in most states, they owe a duty to Joe to be neutral and fair to him while working for his opponent, the bank, who's trying to take his home. So what do they do? Well, they publish notice in a newspaper, uh, maybe a few times, and then they foreclose. And when they do, they hold a sale. These are sometimes called REO sales or foreclosure sales. That's R-E-O, uh, or a foreclosure sale. And they sell Joe's house. Who do they sell it to? Well, these happen on the courthouse steps or usually inside the courthouse in a corner somewhere, uh, and people can come and bid. The most common bidder are other banks, or Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, who you probably heard of. And this is what's really interesting, a lot of times the bidder on Joe's home is also the client of the trustee, because the trustee is a law firm that represents banks. So sometimes you have the bank's lawyer selling Joe's house to another one of its clients. And for that service, they charge Joe a fee. That's how this works. And then now Joe's home is sold. Trustee, you would hope, in this climate, because if you work in this field, you at least know some of what we just talked about. You'd hope they might check to see if the title's right. They might make sure that the bank who's foreclosing bought it properly from whatever banks had it before. Uh, they might check the payment history because there's been an awful lot of stories of problems with payment. Or here's a really simple one. Shouldn't they at least see if there's been any robo-signed documents in the file? Uh, if even the assignments in this file have been signed by people that are known to have committed perjury or known to be robo-signers in other states. Uh, but the truth is they don't do those things. They move forward, uh, and in fact, they'll often tell you, uh, it is our job to do what the bank told us, uh, so we're gonna move forward and do what the bank told us, and we're not gonna talk much to Joe, even if we do owe him a duty of trust and faith and fair dealing. So now here's Joe. 
Let's look at it from Joe's perspective. Joe's being told he didn't pay. What if he thinks he did? If he talks to the servicer, they don't actually own the note. And they might be the second or third or fourth servicer. That's the person collecting money. They might be the second or third or fourth in a row. If he tries to talk to the bank, if he knows who it is and can find them, they weren't who he used to deal with. And if he says, I had a deal with bank two where they told me to pay this, they say, often, sorry, don't know much about bank two. We didn't have that deal with you. Uh, if he says, who in the hell is Wells Fargo, formerly known as Wachovia, as the attorney, in fact, for U.S. Bank, as the trustee for some big long thing, good luck. So Joe's got a problem. Even if he thinks he paid, even if he thinks he had a deal, even if he thinks they were talking about a deal, how does he fight this? Well, it's tough because he doesn't know who to fight. And in many states, they don't even have to come to court. And when they do come to court, they were often coming in with cooked up documents. So this is Joe. Somebody who took out a loan, wanted to pay it, believed he could pay the monthly payment, found out the monthly payment was too high uh, and couldn't pay, or worked out some deal with the bank to make different payments and lost his house, or, as happens in some cases, uh, and I've seen this with my own eyes, uh, people are paying their notes monthly on time and are getting foreclosure notices while they're on time. If you look back at the images we just drew, you might be able to understand how that happens because this is an ungodly mess hundreds of thousands, millions of loans being packaged, sold, moved, and moved. Now, imagine if the trustee says, you know, I was looking for Joe's note and I can't find it. Or, I don't understand the payment history for Joe. Well, the, the bank that sold it to him may or may not exist. And what we know for sure is, some of these original lenders we talked about, a lot of them are long gone. All right, and so this has become a huge mess. So you might be able to tell from what I've said to you so far uh, that the idea that people want free homes and that, and that Joe just was a bum who didn't want to pay, um, that's not what I've seen and I would challenge you to go out and really talk to people. First, give it the old logic test. How many people took loans on homes where they'd be obligated to pay for 30 years and they'd pick their family up and move them in and put their kids in a school uh, and they'd move their stuff in and call it home, but they didn't intend to stay because they knew they couldn't pay the loan? Who does that? All right, so the first thing that happened is most people who took loans intended to pay, they didn't understand the loans because the loans became immensely more complicated than ever before. And because there were lenders out there who really didn't care if they were telling the truth or making loans people could pay. The other thing is, is you know, people say, well, you know, what's the solution to this? I mean, we're not going to give Joe a free house. Well, I, I agree. Um, but what I think a lot of states are starting to say and what a lot of people are starting to think is fair is, before Joe gets kicked out of his house, we ought to know for sure who owns the note whether or not Joe paid, who has the, the security interest in his house, and whether those people are in front of the court. And we ought to know for sure that's worked out. And if we're in a state where you don't have to go to court, first of all, maybe you should have to go to court. Maybe we need to change that. And second, if you don't, maybe this trustee should be somebody who's truly neutral, not the hand-picked right-hand man of the bank that's kicking Joe out. And I'd say this last, even when they don't have a proof of security, Joe owes somebody money and they're gonna have a chance to try to collect that money. What we're talking about is should they be able to throw Joe out of his home and displace his family before they can even prove up the right to do it. And so that's, that's some of what we can Let me throw sort of a, one more thing at you for those of you who have kept up so far. Um, I wanna to talk to you about something that you're gonna think I made it up because it is so surreal uh, that you're not gonna believe at first this could happen, but it did. All right, this is a true story and it makes you think of the saying that the truth is stranger than fiction or reality is stranger than fiction. Uh, let me talk to you about something called MERS. M-E-R-S, the Mortgage Electronic Registry System. What's MERS? Well, this is something, okay? So to do this, let me walk you over to a real simple drawing. This was a company that was invented by all the banks, lenders, servicers, and some firms uh, it was a company that was invented so that they could pretend this company holds interest in properties so that they didn't have to record who actually held interest in properties. All right? Let me say it one more time. This is a company that was invented by a lot of other companies, mostly big banks, uh, and the whole purpose was so that MERS could pretend to own property so that those banks didn't have to record that they did. So you're thinking, 
Why would anybody do that and how could it work? Well, here's the thing. It used to be that, and I'm going to use simple terms that I'll just warn you are not all uh, legal in the sense that in states the terms differ. I'm going to try to use simple words. So when somebody took a loan, there was a note. That was the loan. That was what obligated you to pay. And there was what can be called a deed or a mortgage or a deed of trust. And that was the document that said, if I don't pay, you get my house. And in most states, they had a law. If you recorded the deed and the note or proof of the note to show this is the deal we made. I loaned money as a bank. I loaned money to Joe. And if Joe doesn't pay the money he owes me on the note, I get to take the house. All right, this is called a secured transaction because the bank is secured. It has property that it can take if it's not paid. And that's why the bank was willing to loan the money. So there was a place in every county called the Recorder of Deeds. And maybe some people had other names, but most of them called them Recorder of Deeds. It was a building where you could go and find out who owned property, who owned it before, who owned it before that, and you could find out if there was a lien on the property. You could find out if a bank had loaned and what would happen if somebody didn't pay. You could do that for your own property or property you wanted to buy. And in fact, these were public records. People could do that for any property. It worked pretty well. So if this is the bank, Bank A, they would record that they had a security interest in the house they, they were, they, that they loaned money to Joe for. And if Joe didn't pay, they could take it. Now, every once in a while, Bank A, for many reasons, might even sell the whole bundle to Bank B. If that happened, it was real simple. Bank A had recorded at the Recorder of Deeds office. Then Bank B would record too. And so if Joe checked on his own property, he'd see that Bank A sold to Bank B. Bank E holds the security in his home. If anybody else checked, they'd see that too. Now, each time there was a recording, there was a fee. And that's how the Recorder of Deeds offices funded themselves. This usually was not a big amount of money. Was, I'd say an average is $35. Uh, and so there'd be a payment to the Recorder of Deeds. And in, response, in return, you could go get hard copies printed for you or check a lot of times these days on a computer screen, and you could see what's happened with a piece of property. Well, remember that when we talked about those pools of loans, they might be 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 loans in a bundle. And those loans could be from 35 states and 500 counties. And they were gonna go from one lender to another, to, a, to, a, to an owner or a note holder, to another, a depositor, to another, to a trustee, they might change hands four, five, six times. Well, following the law for the last several hundred years, that needed to be recorded. Transfer from A to B to C to D. And that way it was public. And everybody knew who owned what, who could collect, who could foreclose. You could check on your own property uh, and you could have some confidence. The banks didn't want to do that anymore. They said it would be too expensive and too complicated for us to record all these transfers of all these notes. And if we had to do that, it might mean we couldn't pull these all together and sell them and move them. So they invented MERS, the Mortgage Electronic Registry System. Get ready. <laughs> You've never heard of a company like this one. This company was formed by a bunch of other companies who were the signatories and founders of MERS. And what they said was, instead of recording at the Recorder of Deeds office, we'll give each note a number. It'll be a big, long number. And then we'll start this uh, you know, little computer place now <laughs> where you can register in a database what's, what happened with that note. And then when that note's transferred, we'll just keep track of it in here. Well, that alone, the fact that they took all the recording out of a public place and put it in a database that you and I can't get to may have been enough to be illegal. But they did more than that. Uh, in addition, they didn't just record that they were transferring it. On the deeds themselves and the deed of trust and those types of documents, they identified MERS as if it was a real company and a real person. And they would say that MERS is the nominee and that it holds interest in the property, but only for somebody else that wouldn't be named. And so it got so bad, and it is right now this far along, that 60% of the mortgages that, that were originated during that time period of MERS, 60% were held 
in the name of MERS. And so if you went to the Recorder of Deeds office and anything was recorded, what you'd find is it was held by MERS, but of course you know enough now to know MERS isn't really a company. It's a company formed by companies who wanted to avoid paying to record. So you don't know who really has a right to collect money from you. You don't know who really could foreclose, you just know it's MERS. If you call MERS, you probably don't get an answer. And if you go online and try to find out your loan using a MERS number, if you could find that, uh, you may or may not get an answer there. So that's kind of what MERS did. Now, how does this work though? Uh, I mean, how can MERS, who's not a real company, pretend to hold it? Well, they were pretty clever. Bank A, Bank B, Bank C, Bank D, the law firms, they all have people that work there full time that are also employees of MERS. Get ready. MERS has about 20,000 vice presidents and executive secretaries and all sorts of titles. And yet MERS doesn't pay any of them. And they've never been to the MERS headquarters. And they weren't hired by anybody at MERS and they've never spoken to anybody who works for MERS. So here's how it goes. Bank A says, oh man, I need, uh, I, I, Bank B, let's say, now has this note and they want to foreclose. And they say, yeah, but we didn't loan, we didn't make the loan, we're not at the recorder of deeds office and we're scared to foreclose without recording something. Well, it's simple. They just record at the recorder of deeds office the last transfer to Bank B and maybe they appoint a successor trustee, a new trustee, if you're in a non-judicial foreclosure state to, to carry out the foreclosure and they do it and if they want, they can do it in the name of MERS. How do they do it in the name of MERS? They just have an employee that works for Bank B put on their MERS hat and say, I'm the vice president of MERS, one of 20,000, and I can sign things for MERS. That same day, they'll sign things as an employee of Bank B. But that's, that's how they got around that. So instead of MERS telling people what to do, the people who formed MERS and who work for MERS but aren't paid by MERS tell MERS what to do. Well, this has created a colossal mess, all right? And there are a lot of courts that are gonna be figuring out if any of this is legal, skipping the recorder of deeds office, because you might be interested to know the law never changed, all right? Everybody used to record the deed and the note and they kept track of who owned property. And you're thinking, well, what law changed that you didn't have to do that anymore? I thought that's how you did it. No law changed, quite literally, no law in 50 states changed at all. And then one day, these big institutional investors and banks decided to change the way everything was recorded, use MERS, cloud the titles, confuse the recorder of deeds office. Uh, San Francisco did a study recently and they found that of about 400 recorded documents or 400 different properties, almost every one of them had an error in the chain of title. Uh, there are now counties such as Dallas County that are suing MERS and the people who thought of MERS because MERS really is not much of a company uh, for thinking of it because they were cheated out of tens of millions of dollars in recording fees and now when you go check on property you don't know who owns it. All right, so MERS is sort of an interesting story in the bigger picture of how documents got messed up, confused, lost, uh, destroyed and or clouded so much that nobody knows who should be foreclosing on property. All right, now we've kind of worked at this in reverse. We started talking about the way things have been done late, lately. I want to talk to you about the way things used to be done for a really long time. I did this on purpose because if you're in your head right now, picture that drawing, which you, <laughs> sorry for the handwriting and the pictures and the arrows, but it's a big mess and it talks about lenders and selling loans and moving loans and recording loans or not recording loans and then uh, it, fake companies called MERS and big long names of people foreclosing on behalf of someone else who's working on behalf of a, a trust that is named as a certificate series that pays benefits to somebody you've never met. Uh, we talk about loans in big bundles that are summarized and rated and traded. And I want to talk to you now about how it used to work. And I think, I'm just going to warn you, I'm, I, I'm not working to understate it or oversimplify it. This is, as I understand it, how it used to be. And when I say used to, I mean, let's go back to the 80s, 70s, 60s, and to some degree, since the founding of the United States, it's worked a lot like this. Here's how it went. There was a bank. They had money. 
There was Joe and he didn't. Joe wanted to buy a house. And so Joe picked out a house he wanted to buy and he went to a bank. It was usually near Joe's home too. And he said, I'd like to buy this house and for it, I'm gonna pay $100,000. The bank said, okay, Joe, in order to do this, we need to do a few simple things. First, we need to see the house and we need to see if it's really worth $100,000. Uh, and we're gonna do that either in some banks, literally we're just gonna go walk through it ourselves because we know houses pretty well in the area. Or we're gonna send out an appraiser that we hired to give us a good honest number on the house. Two, Joe, we need to know if you can pay. So we're gonna look at how much you make. We're gonna look at whether you paid your bills in the past. And we're gonna look at what ties you had with the community and everything else. And we wanna make sure, Joe, that you're gonna pay us because we would be giving you money. And if they decided that Joe qualified and if they decided that the house was pretty good, they'd usually ask Joe to have a skin in the game and he'd have to put some money down. Maybe he'd put down $10,000 or 10%. And in doing so, Joe's invested in the home. There's a little equity, meaning the bank is loaning Joe a little less than the house is worth. And here's what happened. Joe made a promise to the bank to pay. The bank made a loan to Joe. The loan, for the terminology we've been using, had a note, right? And Joe gave them some sort of security in the deed, something in a mortgage to say, if I don't pay, you can take my house. Now, you can probably figure out, the bank wants Joe to pay because for closing on a house where it's worth 100 and they're owed 90, by the time they go through the trouble to foreclose and then they have to try to sell it and they're not professional sellers and there's this time where they're not getting paid, it's by no means profitable for them to foreclose on homes. What is profitable is for Joe to pay them interest for 30 years on $90,000. And for Joe, he wants to pay too. Now, this bank has no reason to try to give Joe a loan for $200,000 if they don't think he can pay it. They have no reason to lie about how much the house is worth because that would mean that they'd loan him more money than it's really worth and if they had to foreclose they'd be in trouble. And what you're seeing here is it's because the bank was planning on keeping the loan, collecting money on the loan, and if Joe didn't pay, foreclosing on the loan. So what happens if the bank calls Joe and says, Joe, you didn't pay us. And Joe says, yes, I did. I have the receipt. Well, he sent the receipt to the bank, a lot of times to the vice president of the bank. <laughs> These weren't big places. And they looked at it and said, sure enough, Joe, our mistake. Or what happened if Joe lost his job and couldn't pay? The bank called him and they said, Joe, you're not paying. And under the terms of our agreement, if you don't pay, we can take your house. And Joe would either say, I'm really sorry, I can't pay and I can't find a way to pay or I've just got a new job, can you give me a month? Can we work something out? The bank would make a decision. Whatever they did, Joe knew he owed the bank money and the bank knew who to collect from. And this bank, if we go back to our lesson on the recorder of deeds, this bank had certainly, certainly done something really simple. They had recorded and everybody could see that the bank had a security interest in the home. So now, if the bank wants the house and Joe's not paying and it needs to take it, it does. It's not happy to do it. It doesn't make money to do it usually. It does it because it can't afford to keep losing money when Joe doesn't pay. So let's look at what happens here. If Joe pays the bank back in the good old days, the bank's happy they're making money. And Joe's happy. He's keeping his house and his family happy. If Joe doesn't pay, the bank is not happy because now they need to foreclose on a home and they're probably not gonna make a lot of money doing that. And Joe's not happy because he loses his house. Look at this picture. It's pretty simple. And even if we added that the bank sold it to another bank, if we have one local bank selling to another local bank that Joe can call and he gets notice and it's recorded, there's very little doubt that the bank has the right to the money and Joe knows who to pay. There's very little risk that they're gonna make loans, at least in any high number, that fail. Because they're gonna work hard not to, because it's in their best interest for the loan to work. Now compare that to the situation where we have a lender who doesn't care if the loan works because they're not gonna keep it. And a salesperson who's commissioned by that lender to make money based on how big of a loan they can make. 
and documents that are now entered into by mail from a company from California or Delaware or somewhere with a guy in Texas buying a house that are signed in triplicate for 100 pages of signatures uh, in front of a notary with an appraisal that happened by mail called a desk appraisal because you don't even see the house uh, with underwriting that doesn't require income requirements anymore. And then that thing, instead of being held by the bank who's going to collect, is sold and sold again and sold again and sold again and then maybe held in the name of a company that doesn't even really exist or recorded in the name of a sentence long entity that nobody's ever heard of or could find for uh, a trust that nobody knows where it is for the benefit of people you've never met held by banks that don't have any at least if they have a local branch they don't have anybody who can make a decision at the local branch and what you've got is we don't have to guess which one works one worked for 200 years one was tried in the last decade and it has resulted in a collapse of an economy, not just the US, but the world. It's resulted in trillions of dollars being spent to bail out banks that came up with a bad idea. It's resulted in uncertainty in our titles to our property, cheating recorder of deeds out of money, and foreclosures that people don't know how to defend, courts don't know how to handle, and everybody's trying to come to grips with while our neighborhoods have more empty homes, our housing values go down, we struggle to find jobs, and we pump more and more money out of the federal government into saving institutions that created the problem. So, if you've listened to this and you've found it helpful at all, I'm glad. And I hope you'll go out and look into this a little more. I hope you'll start asking some simple questions when you hear people talking about not regulating this kind of stuff. Uh, when you hear people saying the homeowners are the only one to blame and they took irresponsible loans and the banks were forced to do this, I hope you'll start to ask yourself which was better? A system that worked for 200 years that put people to account for the decisions they made, both the lender and the borrower, and that was transparent to the public, or a shadow system in which banks profit whether or not loans work, homeowners lose even when they do their best to take out a reasonable loan, documents can't be found, recordings are not public, and the whole thing is a shambles. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I, I hope uh, that if you enjoyed this video, if maybe you didn't enjoy it but it helped, uh, that you'll share it with friends so that together we can start learning about this and making sure it never happens again.